Hi, this is Rob Hawley from the Fremont Peak Observatory. A number of questions have come up since publishing my original lecture in 2017, so let me pass along the answers that I've given since then. But first to reiterate the premise of the entire series. An eclipse is a unique experience. Don't waste the eclipse by spending your time futzing with your camera. Experience it. Here are a number of topics that have come up. Let me provide answers to those and in some cases amend what I've told you previously. I provided some guidance in the videos from my own experience taking photos in the past. However, I did not try to cover all circumstances. For a more complete list of what exposures will capture what phenomena, I suggest you go back to the original source, and that's Espinac's work cited here. My capture of clips program that I mentioned in equipment is entirely based on Fred's exposures, and I vet them by showing exposures of my own. I'm a great fan of recording the experience of an eclipse using wide-angle video cameras. However, I've never seen video cameras attached to a telephoto do a very good job about recording an eclipse. There are a couple problems. First is poor focus or poor resolution or operating beyond the limits of the zoom. In any event, what you end up with is something that's not really sharp. The second is the camera will need manual adjustments, and that's going to detract from the eclipse experience. The last is that you're going to probably be spending your time looking at a little screen, which is going to be recording what your video camera sees, instead of looking at the sky and viewing the eclipse. That's not what this series is intended to try to get you to do. One tidbit I learned in the prep sessions for this 2023 trip was how to avoid a problem taking eclipse photos with your phone. If you do nothing, there's a possibility the phone's autofocus will go wild during totality, just as happens with movie cameras. Locking the focus is easy, and I provide instructions for an iPhone. As usual, with an Android, you'll have to look up the instructions for your specific phone. In my videos, I mentioned that I use a special astronomical camera with a modified filter. A number of people have asked me if this is a requirement, and the answer is, well, it's not, but understand the trade-off. The prominences and the chromosphere glow with hydrogen gas. And hydrogen emits at very specific frequencies, as shown in this picture. A conventional camera will partially filter the deep red hydrogen alpha. That will mean that the resulting image will contain more blue and green, as compared to the image that I will take where the H-alpha is not filtered. And so the hydrogen will end up looking kind of pinkish. Not bad, but that's the trade-off. During the development of Capture Eclipse, I bought an ADDA with the normal filter removed and a special H-alpha filter. And while I'm sure it's going to do a great job capturing H-alpha, I found that color balance on everything else is going to be a problem. This is something I haven't resolved yet. I want to give you a heads up, and if anybody does have a solution, I would really like to hear it. DSLRs can only take pictures so fast. If you try to take too many pictures in too short a time, you fill up the queue being written and it will stop taking pictures. This happened to me in 2010. If you take a look at my video on Bailey's Beach, you will notice gaps in the times. That's when the camera stalled. The Capture Eclipse app contains a tool to measure how fast your camera will run. What I found is with the latest version of the Canon software, the 60DA will run just slightly faster than one second per exposure. That's a bit of a disappointment since previous version of the Canon software I could run at about half a second. And I used to be able to use high speed mode, but that stopped working. I have no reason to believe that triggering the camera externally would give you a different result. So my suggestion is to use the tool in Capture Eclipse and measure it, and that will give you a good idea about what your camera can actually do. Next to worrying about getting stuck in traffic on Eclipse Day, my next biggest worry is a sun with no sunspots, and how do I focus? I was asked during some of my presentations, well, can you just focus on a hill? And I never tried it, so I wasn't sure. So I did an experiment. I set my telescope up about a mile from a hill that has a bunch of antennas with very fine detail, including wires leading from them. A perfect focus target. I adjusted my telescope to make these perfectly in focus. I then put on my solar filter and swung the telescope towards the sun. As you can see, the focus is pretty much perfect. Let's zoom into full frame. Two little tiny sunspots. While these don't look perfectly crisp, 
This is about what you'd expect. Make sure you pick a target far away. My target was about a mile and I wouldn't try anything much closer than that. Otherwise you're not going to get a true infinity. The next questions refer to tracking. For the first couple of eclipses I did, I tried manually tracking. And boy, let me tell you, it did not meet KISS. Thus, for eclipses on land, I haven't tried to manually adjust a camera for more than 10 years. The question that I keep getting asked is, do you really need a tracking mount or can you take the pictures just from a tripod? So I decided to perform an experiment. For this experiment, I'm using my standard optics on an equatorial mount but with the tracking off. In theory, I aligned the camera to where the sun should move, but it turns out I got it wrong. I've taken the liberty of photoshopping in an HDR image of an eclipse to show you how the framing will be affected by the sun's movement. The interesting stuff in eclipse starts about two minutes before the eclipse. Again, if you take the premise of my videos, watching this stuff is going to be your highest priority. So we're going to start with the camera aligned with the sun a little off center about two minutes before totality. If you're following my recommendations, you've replaced your solar filter with a hat and you're now spending your time looking at the oncoming eclipse. You've lost the ability to look through your viewfinder until C2 actually happens. However, you can still make adjustments using your soul searcher. And after filters off, you can use a screen on your camera. It's now C2. Look how much the sun has moved. You're now cropping the corona. Maxima eclipse, the sun is continuing to march towards the edge of your screen. C3, totality is coming to an end. And again, the sun is close to the edge of the field of view. So what's my conclusion from this? With my optics, manual adjustment will be required continuously during totality to keep the sun centered. To have any chance at all means you'll need a gear head, and preferably a gear head tilted at your latitude so that a single adjustment will track the sun. The whole reason I've taken tracking mounts to places as distant as Svalbard and Easter Island was that I wanted to experience the eclipse and not chase the sun. I based my experiment on an eclipse that was as long as the 2020 eclipse. The April 23 eclipse is really short and therefore a non-tracking mount might be more plausible for something like this. Capture Eclipse includes a setting for a fixed mount that restricts the minimum speed of the camera. I'm still going to take a tracking mount though. Throughout this series I've emphasized safety and I want to close by re-emphasizing it here. Looking at the sun is dangerous. However, if you follow the advice I've given in the series, this will be a safe and rewarding experience for you. If you have further questions, please feel free to submit them either as YouTube comments or by email to eclipse at fpoa.net.